The visionary priestess of Greece's oldest oracle, Delphi, was known as the Pythia and was consulted on all matters of national importance until its closure in the 4th century AD by the prohibitions of the Christian emperor Theodosius, who left the sacred site to be later destroyed by rampaging Christian monks. Figured monuments show the Pythia in a calm, serene, concentrated state, sitting at a stool, breathing in fumes that arose from an open fissure in the floor that was believed to produce an ecstatic exaltation. By what means she attained this state, has been a mystery scholars have debated for centuries. Ancient records tell of mystical, sweet-smelling vapors rising from the earth, putting the Pythia under Apollo's spell. But while the reciting of prophecies is historical fact, questions about those vapors remain. With a disassociated of trance-like state produced from the vapors and the Thracian influence on the Delphic Oracle, it has been conjectured that the Pythia likely put forth revelations from behind a veil of cannabis smoke that arose from a brazier beneath the floor, and this idea has been suggested by a variety of different sources. The late Professor C. Scott Littleton explored the possibility of cannabis use by the Pythia in his 1986 essay, The Numa Enthusiasticon, on the possibility of hallucinogenic vapors at Delphi and Dodona. When he wrote the Numa Enthusiasticon, Littleton noted that scrapings of residue from the site would go a long way to proving his hypothesis. I had the opportunity to talk and correspond with Professor Littleton at great length while I was writing my book Cannabis and the Soma Solution, as Littleton was a recognized expert on Indo-European groups like the Scythians and the authors of the Vedas and Avesta. When I queried him on his effort to obtain a sample scraping from the site at Delphi, he lamented that he was forbidden from doing so. Greek legend tells us that the site of Delphi itself was thought to possess a mystic power. Before the time of the oracle, the myth says, a herdsman following his goats into a rugged glen was suddenly overcome with visions of his future. The legends also claim that mysterious breezes and fragrances often fill the city. Whether cannabis was evolved in, at Delphi, this is a problem because probably not, except as a common ingredient in incense in general. In the case of, of uh, Delphi, the latest view is that the priestess in inhaled fumes from a seismic vent in, in the temple, and so it's an ethylene gas. Analysis of the bedrock beneath the temple also shows the existence of petrochemicals, including ethylene. Ethylene has been used as an anesthetic in modern days, but when administered in experimental small doses, induced a trance-like state. And the trance state had a lot of similarities with the description of the Pythia there in the Temple of Delphi. Scholars think water running underground could have carried gases up through the fault lines directly to the priestess. The later discovery of evidence of ethylene gas at this site also led Professor Littleton to question the hypothesis he put forth in 1986 when the consensus then among geologists was that there were no naturally occurring fumes at Delphi or fissures for them to rise through. However, Littleton still regarded the possibility of cannabis in addition to the naturally occurring ethylene gas at Delphi, as has Professor Ruck in the general form of an incense that was commonly used at temple sites.
also, as far as botanical sources are concerned, it, uh, it's documented that it, it's Daphne or the Bay Laurel, which may or may not be psychoactive. So it's not so clear, uh, except in the general sense of sacred space being incense, that she got high from uh, cannabis. And depending on what kind of oracle is around, if it's a sleep oracle or if it's if it's an oracle at Delphi, they have different drugs for each one. And cannabis is all over the place as an incense. Thus, evidence of the prophetic ecstasy brought on by the fumes of the giant serpent killed by Apollo at Delphi need not negate the use of cannabis as a sterion, the starry herb which spoke the language of the stars which set life's course. But I'm told that at the Necrotaphion in uh, northwestern Greece, which was an entrance to the underworld at Akron, they have found uh, containers with residue of, of cannabis in them. In regards to the find of cannabis residue at Akaron, Professor Ruck is referring to the discovery that was discussed in the 1982 book, The Mystery of the Oracles, by Philip Vandenberg. Vandenberg referred to the archaeologist Soterios de Caris's find of hashish at the 4th and 3rd century Nekiomantion, a place for consulting the dead, on the river Acheron, one of the most famous entrances to the netherworld. What is an oracle? We don't have these things sitting around today, so we, we don't understand the Greek way of thinking about it. An oracle is your closest contact to the gods. This is the gateway. If you look at these oracles, we have them preserved. So here's what, here's what happens. You have a priestess, and somebody, somebody comes and goes through a ceremony of purification. You know, it's a bath. You buy your whatever supplies you need, and you take a bath. You present this stuff to the priestess. There's baking of cakes burning them. There's a whole procedure for doing this stuff and what the cakes are shaped like and what they do. All of that stuff has asteria. And you have a dream oracle then. So this relaxes you. And you sit in the temple and ultimately you have a, a dream oracle. And there's the consistency across all of these oracles is that, these sleep oracles, is that you go in there, you use these substances that you're given, and you have a performance, a ritual performance. And so you could stand back and look at the substances and say, what are, the, what are they doing? What are these things doing? So she, the girl on this night, she goes into the oracle and she burns the incense and she goes through the ritual purification and uh, all of this stuff has the THC in it, all of it. This sort of temple sleep was a common method of religious experience throughout the ancient world, as referred to by Dr. Hillman. And his assessment is similar to that put forth by the 19th century scholar John Porter Brown almost a century and a half ago. Unfortunately, little can be found on Dicaris's alleged find of Greek hashish. James Weissman, in his review of Dicaris's work, omits any reference to hashish. Likewise, the Hellenic Mystery of Culture's internet page for this archaeological site makes no reference to these sacks of hashish. If there was such a find of Asian hashish, such censoring leads one to believe that here again we may find academic prejudice acting as a superstitious flaming cherubim blocking the way to historical fact. Professor Carl Ruck also tried to inquire about the evidence of this claim, and as a well-respected professor of classics, you would think he would be able to access it, but he was basically stonewalled as well. I did contact the archaeologists to find out whether this was true or not, and it is a topic that classicists find too hot to handle, so even though he was a friend, he never responded. If reports of this find are indeed correct, then here in this Grecian temple we may have our oldest examples of hashish. Vandenberg still referred to Dicaris's find of Greek hashish in his 2007 edition of the Mysteries of the Oracles, 25 years after the first publication. So one might conclude this claim holds and has simply been ignored for its historical relevance. The riddle-like oracles given by the Pythia Delphi, discussed earlier, were deciphered by a priesthood that in times of corruption were said to have interpreted them to, to suit their own agendas. Pythagoras, who lived about 497 BC, the Greek philosopher and mathematician, 
reform this priesthood through purifying rituals and despite angry protests from the male priests, he went against tradition and initiated the female Pythia, Theocala. Pythagoras made influential contributions to philosophy and religion. He is often revered as a great mathematician, mystic, and scientist, and is best known for the Pythagorean theorem, which bears his name. Interestingly, the Book of Lists has Pythagoras first on a list of marijuana users. I've never been able to figure out what that was based on. However, Iambilicus referred to libations and sacrifices with fumigations and incenses being performed by Pythagoras and his initiates, and there has been some speculation about what was in these preparations. Commenting on the word frankincense, which means pure incense, aromatherapy expert Susan Fisher Rizzi noted that we once called all herbs burnt as incense frankincense. A statement in tune with that Dr. Hillman referred to earlier in regards to Marion and the combination of cannabis and myrrh in temple incense plants. And these sorts of mixes in ancient Greece have also been referred to by botanist Professor William M. Bowden. That agent incense plants sold at considerable cost as frankincense could have contained the highly aromatic and magically effective cannabis seems likely. Today the word frankincense has come to specify the gum resin of the North African tree Boswellia and Fisher Rizzi and others have pointed out that this modern source also contains psychoactive properties comparable in some ways to those of cannabis and that its use in modern churches helps to instill chemically induced feelings of religious awe and well-being. The suggestion that Pythagoras received inspiration from cannabis was first put forth by the 19th century author and hashish experimenter Fitzhugh Ludlow, who suggested that elements like Pythagoras' hearing his name called out in the gurgling of a stream, along with taking on the identity of deities and other events, indicate, as in Ludlow's own experience with a drug, intoxication with him. Pythagoras based his system around the teachings of hemp using Thracian Orphics, and he himself can clearly be described as a shaman, as Pythagoras had the ability to leave his body while in trance. Pythagoras, as with Democritus, who we discussed for his potential use of a cannabis-infused wine, traveled through Egypt, Ethiopia, Arabia, and Persia, visiting sects of psychoactive plant using shaman priests known as magi, and he referred to the potent psychotropic sacraments which they used. Porphyry recorded that the Greek philosopher personally met the Persian shaman, Zoroaster. It would be hard to believe that Pythagoras could have come into contact with these cultures and not been exposed to cannabis. Scholars have long noted Zoroaster's use of cannabis to achieve ecstasy, and the mythology around the Persian psychopomp shows that the others were initiated into its use, and in some cases, it was administered in wine like Democritus's preparation from Bactria. The Chaldeans used cannabu, cannabis incense, ointments, and in ingestive preparations. Recipes for cannabis incenses, regarded as copies of much older versions, were found in the cuneiform library of the legendary Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, and records from the time of his father, Esarhaddon, indicate cannabis, cannabu, was one of the main ingredients of the sacred rites. The Egyptians used topical cannabis med medicines under the name Shem Shemet and possibly in wine preparations like the aforementioned Nepenthe. <laughs> 